teased you with a warm-up what I was going to say. I'm going to say something completely different. Um, given timings, it seems to me that the important issue that I make sure that I've covered properly this afternoon is the non-party um, point. Um, uh, I will park, therefore, for the moment, the burden of proof point, the West London pipelines. Um, we do say that's very straightforward, but I'll come back to it when I've got time. What I would like to do is make sure that I said what I need to say on the non-party point. I did wonder when you finished um, whether you really needed to say any more, by which I don't mean that you're... No, no I understand exactly <laughs> right. what my Lord means. Um, uh, 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 and, yeah. Um, I'm going to please... Anyway, but yeah, obviously, unless you get to time problems, you'll come back to it shortly at the yeah. end. Yeah. Okay. Well, shortly, short, yeah, I, I will come back to it. Um, my, my Lord's, um, the non-party issue is um, the question of who uh, is... Sorry, let me start again. Can someone who is not and does not expect formally to be a party to litigation, who I shall refer to as a non-party, ever claim litigation privilege if the test for litigation privilege is otherwise met. The test for litigation privilege uh, is common ground, subject to this issue, set out uh, in our skeleton argument of paragraph 60. Um, and my learned friend uh, indicated, I think, that there's no dispute about that. Mr. Allen says that that is a test that is fulfilled in relation to each of the pieces of litigation uh, to which uh, Decker were a non-party, um, uh, and it comprises that those comprise five pieces of litigation to which my own friend referred to. So, could I just have your formulation again? I noticed it on the transcript. But... Can someone yeah. who is not and does not expect formally to be a party to litigation, who I shall refer to as a non-party, yeah. ever claim litigation privilege? if the test for litigation privilege is otherwise met. <clears throat> yes. um, uh, there is no challenge um, to, to, to the evidence of Mr. Allen that the dominant purpose test uh, is, is met in relation to those pieces of litigation. Um, and that is, uh, we say, the short answer to the um, point that my learned friend started with, which is about conducting litigation. We are, the present assumption is that that test is um, met. Um, and the question is, if it is met, does the fact that you are not a party and don't expect to be one um, uh, uh, sufficient um, to, to rule out litigation privilege? Um, and um, th this is an issue that the judge did deal with at some length in his judgment. Um, you'll have the references uh, to that, but we give them in paragraph 70 of our skeleton argument. Um, and in our written document, uh, we explain why he was right to do so. Um, we accept, of course, that the cases uh, in which uh, uh, the test will be able to be satisfied, um, the test for litigation privilege in relation to a non-party, um, will, will be relatively um, infrequent. Um, but, but, but where it is met, uh, as here, um, we say um, that litigation privilege can be claimed. Um, can I make three general points about authority in this area? before I get into some of the, um, uh, the arguments of principle, as it were. Um, first, we of course recognize, uh, as the judge did, that three textbooks in this area proceed uh, on the basis that the appellant is right on this point. But uh, as the uh, judge rightly held, it is an unpromising start. The different single authority relied upon by each of their authors does not support the proposition put forward. Indeed, um, my learned friend rightly does not seek to suggest otherwise in respect to the authority relied on in Hollander, and I'll deal with those authorities relied on uh, in Passmore and Banky shortly. Uh, moreover, none of the three textbooks consider in this context that the authorities on which the judge relied and we rely, and I'll come to those, and none of them articulate a principled reason for the proposition. Second, it, it is unsurprising that statements in the cases regarding LIP are often couched in terms of parties to litigation, since that, of course, is the paradigm context in which the LIP test is likely to be said to be satisfied, and was the context in those cases in which the point arose. Uh, without there having been in those cases any discussion, which would have been unnecessary on their facts, about whether it could arise in relation to a non-party. Um, so we would respectfully suggest that you don't get much by lifting those statements out of their context. You also need to be a bit careful about the use of the word. This is your third point. No, it's part it's of the second. More, more of your second. Yep. Um, you also need to be a bit careful about the use of the word party, um, it, it, just as it were expressed in those bare terms in the cases, because it can mean one 
of two things. It could mean a party to the relevant litigation, um, or, or it might and often does mean simply a party claiming privilege to distinguish them from third parties with whom they've communicated or the solicitor. Uh, and we say um, the paragraph uh, is, <coughs> uh, which my learned friend relies on from Lord Castle's speech in Three Rivers Number 6, um, uh, paragraph 102 of that judgment, that's the paragraph also relied upon by Passmore. Um, uh, that is plainly the sense in which party is being used in that paragraph. The third point uh, is that set against the statements which do couch the test in terms which refer to a party to litigation, there are plenty of other statements that do not, um, including classically the statement of the principal by Barwick, uh, the Chief Justice Barwick, who was in the minority in Grant and Downs, the Australian High Court case, uh, which was approved by the House of Lords in uh, war. Uh, similarly, for example, there is no reference to any requirement that a person claiming LIP has to be or be reasonably contemplated to be a party to litigation in the statutory definition of privilege in section 10, subparagraph 1b of PES. Um, and that's uh, in the authorities bundle at page 1831. Um, and although it is suggested by my learned friends in, skeleton, in their skeleton argument at paragraph 83.4, that the court in the Queen and Davis um, uh, interpreted uh, Section 10 as uh, applying only to a party. Um, if you look at the relevant paragraph, it actually uses party in the other sense I've described it. It's not about a party to litigation. And the same is true when you look at Blackstone and Archibald. None of those, in fact, support the proposition, which is right. I don't say they're against it. I just say you don't get anything uh, from them. What you do get is that Section 101 b did not think it necessary um, to refer to what is said to be an essential prerequisite of the existence of LIP. Um, can I then say something about, uh, first, about the rationale for LIP, um, uh, which it said is, does not apply to a non party, and second, uh, about the supposed incompatibility of the judge's conclusion with the criminal disclosure regime? Um, as for the former, we don't accept the agreed rationale of a safe space uh, that lies behind LIP applies only to parties to litigation um, and not to non-parties. And we set out the reason for that in our skeleton argument at paragraphs 81 to 84. On the contrary, we say that if the test for LIP is otherwise made out, the primary rationale for LIP to provide what is sometimes referred to as a safe space for a person and their lawyers to communicate freely with candor with third parties for the dominant purpose of litigation applies just as much to non-parties. And my laws will remember that in, uh, no doubt remember that in ninth, paragraph 83 of our skeleton argument, we give various um, examples of instances where we say um, it, it, it um, uh, will uh, make obvious sense, and we be quite wholly surprising, we say, um, for there to be no the rationale applies as much to those uh, parties in that position, those non-parties, as to a, a um, uh, party. Um, and just um, the second example is obviously particularly relevant. It's page 100 of the um, bundle, the core bundle. The second example is obviously particularly relevant to our case, um, because as you know, in the UAE, a victim of a crime can claim compensation within the criminal proceedings against the accused without being a party to that's Mr. Allen's ninth witness statement in paragraph 45. And as you can see from paragraph 44 of that statement, um, it, that is indeed what happened um, in the four pieces of uh, criminal proceedings against Mr. Sadek, where, where um, uh, compensation was indeed awarded. Um, uh, and may, that may well be uh, the case in uh, other countries too. Um, as may the fact be, that, uh, as it is in the UAE, a victim of crime must make a formal com criminal complaint, providing evidence about what they say has happened, as Mr. Allen explains uh, in Allen 9, paragraph 63, subparagraph 8. Um, and, of course, in the case of frauds of the sort believed to be perpetrated uh, by Mr. Sadek on Deckert's former clients, that would necessarily require considerable prior investigation. All the more so if, as here, the prosecutor then requested assistance from the lawyer acting for the client because of the complexity of the alleged crimes and the expertise required to investigate them. 
We say that the rationale for LIP applies just as much to such a person as to a party to the litigation because of their particular interest in the litigation, despite not being a party to it. And we say that that is all that the judge meant when he referred to sufficient interest. It is not, as it were, a freestanding test that needs to be applied. It simply describes the, the category of people who are, um, who may um, uh, end up in communications that otherwise satisfy um, the dominant uh, purpose test. And everything that my learned friends say, therefore, about the sufficient interest test is, we say, therefore, aimed at a street straw man. Um, as we understood it, uh, my learned friends accepted <coughs> subcategory two on, on page 100 would, in fact, be a, a case where they would accept that the non-party would um, have LIP, um, but, but only it was suggested in relation to some part of the claim. Um, with respect, we found that difficult to uh, uh, follow. Um, once my learned friend makes the concession which is made, it is impossible to see one how one starts parsing uh, the litigation into component parts. And there is no authority we are aware of which supports such an approach. <coughs> so we do say that the concession is fatal um, to criminal litigation in which such a claim for compensation could be made, and the judge was therefore entirely right on my learned friend also concedes that three is an instance of a non-party case where LIP uh, would uh, uh, run. Um, there, on the basis uh, of uh, Guinness Peak, which I will come to, um, because it's said that um, the ratio of that is, is it works, but only if, if you are the real defendant. We don't real party. We don't accept that, and I'll come to it in a moment. Um, and in relation to subparagraph four. Um, as I, we understood it, the suggestion was that there would be LIP, but it would be that of B or C, not X. And presumably that was said on the basis of Schneider. But if one looks at the hypothesis we've actually set out there, um, the relevant privilege could not possibly be that of B or C. It would have to be, if it was anybody's, X. X is. Another example that I haven't put in this paragraph, or we haven't put in this paragraph, uh, is uh, in relation to representative actions or test cases. Take, for example, the FCA test case relating to business interruption insurance involving a selection of insurers with different wordings who were party to the test case, but where there were myriad other insurers in the wings who would be potentially affected very significantly by the outcome of the test case. If those non-party insurers wanted to make sure that those insurers who were part of the test case were, being, were putting forward, for example, the right expert uh, evidence, it would, we suggest, be very surprising if communications between their, the non-party uh, insurers, and an expert in order to enable them potentially to feed into the case from behind the scenes were not the subject of LIP, such that the FCA could, in principle, have sought third-party disclosure of all communications between the non-party's lawyers and their shadow expert. Another example would be a joint venture company, which is sued. Um, and the structure of the joint venture means that the two parties to the joint venture have potentially different interests in the outcome of the case, but neither is a party to the claim or likely to become one. And each of those uh, joint venturers engages a lawyer to advise it <coughs> um, uh, in relation to the litigation, um, and for that purpose to communicate, communicate with third parties, including, for example, an expert, all for the dominant purpose of potentially feeding into um, the uh, strategy of the um, uh, actual joint venture company's uh, uh, defence. Um, we say it makes no sense for each of the joint venture companies not to be able to benefit from LIP um, in relation to their communications with third parties or their lawyers' communications with third parties, such that not only the claimant, but also the other joint venture partner, in the event of a subsequent dispute between the partners, would be entitled to this key disclosure of all of those communications. So you say the same would apply if it's, say, a parent company and it's the subsidiary of That all we do. Yes. If the dominant purpose test is satisfied, um, that's the premise. Um, but, and, and in some of these, um, as it were, um, it, it may be that 
that would be the, the parent company would have a different reason um, for doing it. But if it was for the dominant purpose of conducting litigation, um, then that we would say that um, the non-party um, claim is privileged. But if it were, it might well be acting as an agent for the litigant in your joint venture example. If the joint, if the two joint venturers are themselves evidence gathering for the purposes of litigation, which the joint venture company is party, they'd be likely to be doing so satisfying the dominant purpose. Well, let's take an example as, as an agent. Not necessarily, my lord. Take an example where they disagree on the strategy going forward, and they each take their own independent uh, uh, um, advice in order to seek to persuade um, the uh, joint venture company as to the appropriate way forward, and those who are running the litigation on their behalf, but neither wishes to disclose to the other or to anybody else um, what um, the base of, they may have their own particular vested interests, and it couldn't possibly be said in that situation that they were doing so as agent for um, the joint venture company. They would be doing so entirely in their own self-interest, but assume that the result of the case went one way against the joint venture company, uh, and the result was that the two joint venturers end up in a dispute about whether the consequence of that is one or other of them is actually picking up the bill, um, it would be extraordinary to find that they each had to disclose to each other everything that they had done for their own private interests, but relevant to, um, or for the purposes of use in yes. um, conducting the litigation. We must think Well, my lord may, may or may not think I have that in mind, but, but it is an acute example which tests the point really quite nicely. Um, it happens that the joint venture companies were in fact joined, but they might not have been, nor might there have been any prospect of them being so. Um, and it does test very hard this proposition. Um, and we say that to draw the line in the place that is suggested, would be wholly artificial, make no sense given the rationale of LIP, and indeed be unjust. And none of those difficulties appear even to have been considered in the textbooks who put forward the proposition relied upon by the appellant, nor were they considered by uh, Mrs. Justice Mulder in the Nero Las Bambas case. Turning then to the supposed incompatibility of the judge's approach with the criminal disclosure regime in England and Wales, there is no such incompatibility. And with respect, the contrary argument conflates two quite distinct points. It, those two points being what documents the prosecution must disclose where the documents are in its hands, and the separate point whether a non party to the criminal proceedings, including the victim, is entitled to assert LIP over a document which otherwise satisfies the test and it does not wish to disclose to anyone, including the prosecution. And the point uh, can be tested this way. It cannot possibly be doubted that a victim of crime is entitled to seek legal advice from a lawyer, and that if they do so, that advice will be subject to legal advice privilege. And neither the prosecution nor the defence would possibly be entitled to demand to have a copy of that privileged advice, no matter how relevant it might be to the defence or the prosecution. That's ultimately the Derby Magistrates case, um, uh, where, where the um, uh, original accused um, uh, resisted disclosure after his acquittal of his legal advice from his <coughs> solicitors, uh, which was said to be potentially highly relevant to the defence of the subsequent accused. And that was so, even though, because of the rule about double jeopardy, he couldn't be um, prosecuted again for the same crime. Um, and no one could possibly suggest that the existence of that privilege is, as it's put in the skeleton argument on the other side, paragraph 83, wholly inconsistent with the criminal disclosure regime in this jurisdiction. But if that is true for LAP, we say the same must necessarily be true for LIP. Put another way, um, for a non-party to be entitled to LIP in respect of documents it holds if the relevant test is met, is no more inconsistent criminal disclosure regime than for it to be entitled, as it plainly is, to res resist disclosure of documents on the grounds of LAP. Now, of course, if a document that was subject to LIP or LAP in favour of a non-party is provided to the prosecution, then the position necessarily is different. Even, even involuntary. If 
if it's a search. It's a different question. Can I take it? I'm going to pick it up. In practice, subject to my Lord's name, privilege would almost certainly thereby be lost for the reasons we give in our skeleton argument, paragraph 10, subparagraph 1. And essentially, that's because the base on which documents are provided to prosecution is that they can be used and disclosed to the defense. But in the unlikely event that privilege wasn't lost by providing the documents to the prosecution, for example, because they were involuntarily provided, they popped up in a search and found their way into the prosecution papers. And the non-party whose privilege it was refused to allow the prosecution to disclose the document to the defense in compliance with the prosecution's disclosure obligations. The prosecution would be faced with a choice it would have to make as to how to run the case, if at all, with those documents. It would have to, just as it would with legal advice privilege, it would have to decide whether the privilege had been lost by the inadvertent disclosure, and therefore whether it had to, could properly return it to the privilege holder. But all these problems arise for LAP just as much as for LIP. So is the premise that the prosecution's duty of disclosure in relation to so-called unused material is only to disclose unprivileged unused material? No, that's not the premise at all. So why does the prosecution have a choice about this? Because it can decide to frame the charges in a different way that doesn't require the disclosure of the documents if they are irrelevant to the charges. But why does it have to make that decision? If its disclosure obligations are framed in terms that it's permitted to disclose privileged documents, that's to say documents which were privileged and remain privileged in the hands of a non-party, why does it have a choice to make? Maybe the answer is it wouldn't in that situation. If the obligation is to disclose even those documents over which a third party maintains privilege, if that is the obligation... I'm asking you, is that the obligation? I don't understand that to be the obligation, but I'm not confident of my territory there, my lord. The point, though, doesn't matter for this reason. Whatever that conundrum is, it applies as much to LAP as to LIP, and it cannot possibly be a reason, therefore, for concluding that the criminal regime is a reason for holding against me on this point in relation to LIP. We will seek to find out the answer. I don't suppose we're going to do so in the remaining time today. If my lord wants us to put in, with the agreement of my learned friend, if we can agree what the answer is, we will. But it doesn't matter for the reason I've given it to the analysis. My lord, I'm sure, wouldn't want to, as it were, misstate it in the judgment. Speaking for myself, I'd be grateful for that assistance from both sides. We will do that. But... Because the point you were making assumes one rather than the other. It assumes the prosecution has the choice. The way in which I was putting it did, but it's relevant to my argument. Yes, I understand. My lord, that's what I wanted to say about the rationale and the criminal regime. Can I turn, then, to the authorities? My learned friends rely on Schneider, but said very little about it orally, and we say they were right not to dwell on it. The fact that an expert instructed by a party to litigation does not have his own privilege in the communications with the instructing party tells you nothing of relevance to this issue. It simply reflects the fact that the relevant dominant purpose of the communications in that example is of the instructing party. It is, therefore, their privilege. They are, in the language of Guinness Peat, the party at whose behest the communications come into being, and it is their privilege, not that of the expert, for that reason. It does not tell you anything about the different example or the case of a non-party and whether they may be able to claim LIP where the test is satisfied in relation to them. I 
just ask you to note that the paragraph in Thank You, to which my learned friends refer, um, uh, maybe it's not they who refer to it, but I just ask you to note, if I can just show you, it's um, Thank You at paragraph 1.36, which is in the authorities' bundle at 64. what they've been 
been asked to do, it was neither here nor there. They don't have their own privilege. Um, otherwise, um, they would have a privilege to resist having been instructed, a privilege as against their instructing party in relation to their very instruction. That, that simply couldn't work. Um, nothing in a who jerk victory game uh, adds anything to the discussion with respect. Um, it, it's simply a, a decision similar to Schneider, but without the oddity um, of requiring someone to disclose um, something uh, the, the privilege in which still ostensibly existed. Um, USA versus Philip Morris, which is the appellant's second main authority, it takes him no further. Um, my learned friend uh, took you to this uh, in the authority fund, I think, at tab 22. Um, we deal with this in our skeleton argument at paragraph 86, subparagraph 2. But the relevant point in this case is simply about the nature of proceedings in relation to which LIP can arise, with the Court of Appeal holding that it cannot arise in relation to a third party disclosure application, or in fact, strictly there, an application for examination of a witness in the United States pursuant to a letter of request, even though the party against whom the application was made was by definition a party, and before that a prospective party, to that application. Um, and that is because, uh, as the Court of Appeal held, um, uh, that is on the basis that such an application, application is not relevant adversarial proceeding. Um, and they are not so because by the very nature of, their, uh, of that application, as the Court uh, held, um, there is no question of the respondent against whom the application is made or its solicitor ever needing to consult with other third parties for the purposes of the application. And one finds that at paragraph 72 of the judgment of Lord Justice uh, Brooke, and that is the basis for the decision. And that says nothing about whether a non-party can claim litigation privilege in relation to adversarial proceedings of a right sort, in relation to which its interest in those proceedings means that it or its lawyer may well want or need to consult with third parties for the relevant dominant purpose. So, my lords, those are the two principal authorities relied on against us, leaving aside for a moment the Minera Las Bambas case, which I'll come to. The three authorities we rely upon are, are the Guinness Peat case, uh, which is in the authorities bundle at tab um, 11. I um, just want to take you briefly, um, if I may.
but for common interest privilege, the <coughs> insured wouldn't have had any privilege. The privilege would have been only that of the insurer. And it is only because of the common interest privilege that the insured was able to share in the insurer's privilege. And that is the ratio of the decision. So that is Court of Appeal authority, the reasoning of which is fundamentally premised on the insurer having the relevant privilege because it satisfied the dominant purpose, although it was never to be a party to the litigation. But the insured benefiting from that because of common interest privilege. And my learned friends accept think they accepted, that that is the effect of that decision. But, they said, it is qualified by what you see between F and G, and it is premised entirely on the point that they were um, the uh, defendant in all but name. And we say that is not right. Um, you can see, indeed, even from um, the start of the paragraph I've just shown you, that mark that paragraph on that page, that the court was moving on to a separate question. And what the point about being the, the um, defendant in all but name is about was answering the House of Lords decision um, in the Jones case, um, which was about uh, a, a trade union uh, member consulting with its trade union. ATE insurer NIG would issue a policy, an ATE policy, 
and proceedings would follow. In the event, the success rate of claims accepted into the scheme was far lower than the participants had it uh, forecast, and NIG suffered very heavy losses. NIG, or strictly speaking, its assignee Winterfur, commenced proceedings against TAG, Roe Cohen, and the panel solicitors, alleging, uh, in summary, and as is relevant uh, for our purposes, that the losses were caused by their negligence in the vetting process. And an important preliminary issue was whether, and if so, to what extent, NIG was entitled to disclosure of documents held by the panel solicitors and or TAG. And that in turn gave rise to an issue as to whether the documents generated by the scheme were subject to LAP or LIP, and if so, in whose favor. And the judgment considers various categories of document and both LAP and LIP. But for our purposes, the relevant discussion relates to what are called pre-ATP <coughs> policy documents. In other words, documents created during the voting process and before the ATE insurance was accepted. You see that in paragraph 42. And as regards um, litigation privilege, um, these documents included, amongst others, communications between the potential claimants and TAG um, as agent for NIG. NIG contended, contended that these documents were either not privileged at all or privileged to them alone, even though they were not parties to the claims in relation to which they issued insurance. You see that at paragraph 43. Whereas the panel solicitors contended that these documents were privileged the potential claimants so that NIG could not have them. Mr. Justice Aikens held that the pre-ATE policy documents were created for the dominant purpose of deciding whether the insurer would issue a policy and not for use in any subsequent litigation of the insured claims, and he therefore accepted NIG's primary contention that the pre-ATE policy documents uh, were not subject to LIP at all, you see that um, conclusion at paragraph 91. Nonetheless, the judge went on to hold that if the documents were subject to LIP, then the privilege holders would be NIG. And that was because the scheme was devised by NIG and all the pre-ATE policy documents were produced through its agent and for <coughs> its NIG's own purpose. If LIP applied, therefore, it would apply to the insurer, ATE insurer, NIG. And you see that at paragraphs 92 to 93 and at paragraph 193, subparagraph 1. So although... I'm just giving a... Yes, eight, 92 to 93 and paragraph 193, subparagraph 1. Sorry, I've given the wrong... Um, Can't be 193. 80, 92 to 93. 139, subparagraph 1. What did I say? 193. I meant 139, subparagraph 1, my lord, I'm very good. So Mr. Justice Aikens held that had there been LIP, in other words, had the dominant purpose test been satisfied, it would have been that of the ATE insurer, who was never expected to become a party to any, any relevant litigation. Um, moreover, it was a party that had no control over the litigation um, and could not possibly be said to be the real defendant. It's not a liability um, uh, in Shura. Um, and just for your note, uh, Mr. Justice Aitkins also, in the course of his judgment, in the context of um, common interest privilege, looked at the Guinness Peak case at paragraph 77 to 78. Um, and um, uh, he uh, understood the repeat case in the way in which we described it, namely um, that, um, uh, that the privilege was that of insurers that went um, uh, to the insured through common interest privilege. So we say Court of Appeal Authority Guinness Pete. Mr. So Justice Aikens, we accept Overtop, but nonetheless um, consistent with, as we say, right 
and, and this suggests that Dakin really had no um, intuitive problem with the answer that he was given. I mean, we say he was right um, not um, to do so. Was, was there actually argument in the case from all the talented counsel, whose names we can see, that uh, there could not be privilege, litigation privilege, in favour of a non-party? I don't think anybody just, thought to suggest that. Just assume that you could. Because yeah, I think that's right. Um, I, uh, I think that is right. Um, again, I think we say that tells you something. Um, uh, and it was squarely in issue as to whose privilege it was if LIP existed. So it wasn't uh, as though it didn't matter. Um, yes, uh, what Justin Aitken has described as the most important question, whose privilege if it existed um, at 92. Um, and um, so it, it wasn't as though this wouldn't have mattered. It was the shortest answer to the entire point. You would have just said, it doesn't matter. They can never claim LIP. Um, Guinness Pete can't help, because that's all based upon, um, uh, uh, so the argument would have had to be. It's, it, it applies only to real parties. We say that's wrong. Um, it applies, uh, 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 and therefore, why are we talking about this? So that part of the decision would have had to be, I mean, necessarily would have had to be different. Um, but, but there it is. Um, uh, it wasn't, um, and uh, it wasn't, as I said, it wasn't argued. And um, you will see that uh, Charles Hollander uh, was one of the counsel in the case. Uh, he wouldn't have been taken. He wouldn't have been taken. It would have been, it would have been one of the enemies. One of the enemies, I don't think. So there it is. Um, uh, we do say that supports us. Uh, Supports us. Again, the final authority to which I want to go on this is Minera Sachs-Bambas, uh, which is uh, a decision that Burton saw, and this is just a small bit where um, she does uh, look at the point. The, the uh, reference in the authorities, uh, I'm not going to take you to it, um, unless you want to, it's about uh, 35. Um, again, though, let me just say something about the facts, because um, we don't actually say the decision was wrong um, there was just part of the reasoning that was superfluous and wrong. Um, the reason we say that is this. That was a case in relation to an SPA between a claimant as buyer and a defendant as seller in relation to a business in Peru. After the sale, there was an investigation of the tax affairs of the acquired business acquired by and that resulted in litigation between the claimant and the tax authorities in Peru. Under the SPA, the defendant seller was entitled to and did take over from the claimant the conduct of part of the proceedings without being party to them. The claimant subsequently brought proceedings here in this country against the defendant for an indemnity under the SPA in respect of any additional tax liability arising out of the Peruvian tax proceedings. And the defendant, the original seller, withheld certain documents from the claimant, including on the basis that they were subject to LIP created for the dominant purpose of the Peruvian proceedings. And the claimant applied to inspect those documents. And on those facts, my lords, one can see right away that it was an unattractive submission of the defendant to say, as appears to have been the fact, that the documents created for the dominant purpose of it actually advancing the claimant's own case were privileged from the claimant whose case it had been advancing. Uh, on those facts, one can understand why the judge got to where she did. And indeed, um, we have no quibble with the reason, or indeed much of what she says about Guinness Pete, right down until in paragraph 31, she turns, um, I, I better get it open, so I thought it was um, the um, Guinness Peak is being used for a rather different purpose. Um, and the bit, it, um, right down until, in paragraph 31 on page 890, 
next sentence, which we say was unnecessary for her decision and is wrong, um, uh, and that's where she says, I accept the claimant's submission that an established principle of litigation privilege can only ever apply. Um, and with respect, um, the court does not seem um, to have uh, had drawn to its attention the point that Guinness Peat only works because it was the insurer's privilege that is given to the insured by LIP, and therefore it is squarely a case where the non-party had a privilege. Um, and um, um, the learned judge was referred to the textbooks. I've said what I need to say about the textbooks. Um, uh, and uh, I'm not going to say anything else. So um, with respect to Mrs. Justice Moore, the, um, Mrs. Justice Moore was, we say, right not to follow the case um, uh, uh, for the reasons he gave and um, I've been uh, attempting give. Um, she got Guinness Peat, as it were, on this aspect wrong. She wasn't showing winter her, um, and none of the party principles were, I guess, had been argued. So, my lords, um, uh, for those reasons, uh, we do say um, that we are right on the non-party point. Mr. Justice Murray, more importantly, was right uh, on the non-party point. Um, and we would ask you to um, uh, uphold the decision. Um, my lords, can I then back to um, uh, the burden of proof um, point. And the issue, as you know, is whether the evidence given by Mr. Allen about each of the dates on which each of the various pieces of litigation was reasonably contemplated was sufficient to establish LIP from those dates in relation to documents produced for the dominant purposes the relevant piece of litigation. The appellant says that is not enough, um, but save in one respect, um, which I'm not going to deal with orally, um, it's in the skeleton arguments, they don't say um, Mr. Allen is wrong, they just say it's not enough. Um, and the result, they say, is not simply, and this is important, the litigation privilege can only be claimed from some later date. They say the litigation privilege cannot be claimed from any date at all. The claim to litigation privilege simply fails, and you see that from the draft order they propose in the core bundle, uh, tab 1, page 14, paragraph 5a. in our skeleton argument at section D2, starting at uh, page 91. Uh, ultimately, uh, we say it's a relatively short and simple point. The dates are, as you know, set out in the uh, relevant table in Allen uh, um, 9, uh, which you looked at it, uh, uh, yesterday, um, where Mr. Allen sets out an explanation of the basis on which those dates are given. Um, and uh, in addition, and I don't think you were shown this, so I just want to remind you of it. Uh, Mr. Allen um, has uh, set out in the usual way, supported by statement of truth, that Allen 9, paragraphs 149 to 151, page Paragraphs are important. Um, they're given no weight at all by my learned friends. But crucially, therefore, Mr. Allen has confirmed that he's personally considered the question of the date, 
not just originally when claiming litigation privilege, um, but for a second time in light of the challenge on this issue. That it's difficult to say anything more or provide any further evidence without referring to the privilege material. That based upon his review of the privilege documents, um, the privilege over which um, uh, Deckert's former clients have not waived, he is satisfied that litigation was in reasonable contemplation from the date he has stated for each piece of litigation. Um, and pausing there, my lords, the fact that there is uh, no evidence from Deckert's former clients um, and that Mr. Allen, as it were, is another step removed um, is neither here nor there. Because if the position is, as he is satisfied it is, clear on the documents, then there's no need to ask the, the question of, of uh, others. Um, and indeed, no doubt, uh, it would simply be said that if uh, we had asked um, other people, when do you say, the answer would have been said to be self-serving. Much better that, um, objectively, Mr. Allen can come to it um, and say, um, by reference to hard evidence that he has seen, albeit privileged evidence, these are the answers. Um, there is one instance where he um, asked, had to ask a question uh, of uh, Deckert, and he did so, um, and he refers to that uh, in his evidence. Um, uh, and um, my, lord, my lords will also uh, have picked up that Alan Nobry have also been uh, involved in ensuring that um, their now clients' privilege uh, is not waived. Um, so to that extent, at least, um, the intermediary Sister has been involved in the process, um, but um, we don't say that that uh, is the key. Um, it is therefore not true to say that the only evidence for the claims to privilege is what is set out in the papers. Um, the evidence for the claim to privilege crucially includes paragraphs 149. To 151. Um, and that is the evidence of an officer of this court about the effect of what he has seen, and that he can provide nothing more by way of evidence without waiving the very disclosed privilege which uh, Deckert's former clients insist is preserved. And that uh, evidence directly contradicts the assumption which the appellant asks you to make in his skeleton argument of paragraph 59.2. In other words, that it can reasonably be assumed that a significant body of non-privileged material would be available to corroborate the dates. Um, Mr. Allen says, not so. Um, and um, in principle, it must be right, um, they say it's obvious, that a party is not required to waive privilege in order to substantiate its claim uh, for privilege. We, of course, accept that if without waiving privilege, the whole of the evidence before the court leads to the conclusion that there is no privilege, then the party claiming privilege will be unable to satisfy the burden that lies upon it, um, and its claim to privilege won't succeed. Um, and that is what the Kyler case says. But what is overlooked about that case is that that is a case where there is other material before the court to suggest that something has gone wrong. Other material suggests that the dates are not the one being or, or that it wasn't in reasonable contemplation of relevance. But the court is able to look at the whole thing and say, absolutely, you don't have to waive privilege, but you've left me with evidence taken as a whole on both sides that doesn't satisfy me. And in that situation, there, there, there it is, subject to the reasonably satisfied test that I'm about to come to. Um, but that's not this case. This case is one where you have the evidence of Mr. Allen, and you have nothing on the other side saying, it's not enough. That's all they say. Um, and um, in circumstances where the reason more has not been said is because of the very privilege, but there is no countervailing evidence at all, or even factor to lead you to suppose that it's either untrue or incomplete by reference to documents which could have been referred to and are not privileged. We say that is um, the only evidence, um, and there is no basis to go behind it. But it is also um, well established that the court should not go behind such evidence uh, uh, un 
unless it is reasonably certain that the conclusion of the solicitor about the documents is wrong or incomplete, um, either from the face of the solicitor's evidence or from other material before the court. And that is uh, Mr. Justice Beetson's uh, judgment in the West London Pipeline case, um, summarising the effect of prior authorities, a summary endorsed by Mr. Justice Hamblin in Starbev, uh, tab 31, by the Court of Appeal in WH Holding, save in relation to the inspection uh, regime, uh, which is not this case, uh, that's tab 36, and again by the Court of Appeal in Victory Game, um, and that's tab uh, 47. Um, and um, the, the, that approach has been uh, followed in many cases and is, is referred to, I think we give it in our skeleton, in one of these uh, uh, textbooks as uh, authoritative. Um, and um, so what basis is there for saying, <coughs> um, even close to reasonably certain that Mr. Allen has got it wrong, or reasonably certain that the evidence is incomplete, by me, which it must mean um, is incomplete in that it hasn't provided information that without waiving privilege could have been provided. We say there is um, none, and the judge's conclusion was inevitable. Reference to other cases about what was or was not enough don't take one anywhere. One needs to be specific about the facts of this case, um, uh, in particular the absence of any um, evidence or suggestion the other way uh, in this case, um, and also bearing in mind the acute fact of this case, which is it's a defendant um, solicitor firm. Um, so the problem of privilege is likely to loom uh, large. Um, and um, it is suggested, I think, by my learned friend, certainly in writing, that the reasonably certain test doesn't apply to this sort of witness statement, but only to something called an affidavit uh, of documents. Um, uh, with respect, there's nothing in the authorities to suggest that's right. West London Pipeline um, refers to, to that, but it doesn't in any other reason. Paragraphs <coughs> 63 to 76 suggest that that is um, the limited context in which this point applies. And as a matter of practice in, in all the courts, um, it's, courts are very wary going behind this, um, and West London Pipeline is, is um, regarded uh, in all in relation to all such claims of privilege as um, a guiding light. Um, the obvious rationale behind West London Pipeline, it, 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 but it's set out in detail in the judgment and the authorities that preceded it. Solicitors are obviously weak officers of the court whose evidence is not without very good reason to be disbelieved. And in addition, the risk of disbelieving the evidence <coughs> in this context is that documents which are in fact privileged wrongly end up having to be disclosed, violating the fundamental right of a party to such privilege. <coughs> and we say it is the absence of those considerations that mean it's slightly different where all that is proposed is that the court inspects the documents, and that's the WH holding. Um, Case because the court is not actually deciding the point at that point, it's just looking at itself at the documents. I should just say, though, for good measure, um, the, the judge, um, Justice Murray, held that even if the reasonably certain test was too high, he would still not have been prepared to go behind the evidence of Mr. Allen, and that's paragraph 185 into judgment. So nothing ultimately actually turned upon the test, and that's a point that my young friends simply don't uh, address. Um, none of the points about the burden of right. Um, he understood the burden of proof entirely, just that he discharged it. <coughs> and that's all I wanted to say on that. Um, <coughs> can I then turn um, to can I say this? Although, as it happens, I've accelerated um, seem to see the finish line. Um, there are um, the three specific errors points. Um, in fact, there are four, including this. But, 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 um, nothing was said about any of those points uh, by the appellant. Um, uh, we've dealt with this in I'm right. Sure that's quite right. I think Mr. Oppenheimer did make the point that um, this can't apply in relation to litigation, uh, which didn't involve. Quite separately from the party point, uh, the non-party point, she made a point, which is one of her, one of the three specific points. That's but it's only rack idea and rack. 
that's then the point, point about the client. Victim. That's yes. the point that my clients, my, sorry, Deckert's former we're clients, were not the victim. Were not the victim. Um, the, the short answer to that, um, we, we, you've seen what we say about that in writing. The first point is that that's a very artificial distinction. It's, it's the rack stage that we've stolen from, um, and um, it, 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 passing the different identities does not uh, work in that way. But in any event, it doesn't matter because this is not a victim specific point. This is a point, a non party point applies to anybody who is a non-party, but in, in respect of whom the relevant dominant purpose test is satisfied. And the premise is that that test is satisfied, and they're ruled out simply because they are a non-party. <coughs> if I'm right on the non-party point, and it is not unique to victims, which was not our case, <coughs> then uh, we say that point goes nowhere. Does that not matter who the clients were. The documents belong to the client. And if the documents belong yes. to Deckard's client. Yes. And if the people <coughs> in respect of whom litigation is contemplated, the, the litigation in respect of Is not as I understand it said, I may have got this wrong, it is not, it wasn't said below, and it's not said, I think, now, um, that um, the wrong people had the contemplation. What, what is people had the wrong, the wrong people contemplated? From the, I see, sorry. What is actually said on this point, as, as we understand it, <coughs> is um, that because Deckert's former clients were not the actual victims, as a result, insofar as Mr. Justice Murray's decision was simply that a victim has sufficient interest to be able to claim LIP, that point did not apply on the facts of this case. The argument in response is twofold. One is, to all intents and purposes, the clients were the victims. But second and more fundamentally, nothing in the non-party point turns upon the specific identity of the person with the interest. Are Deckert's former clients had the dominant purpose, these documents, the, the hypothesis these documents came in um, are the result of the dominant purpose um, test being satisfied, and the question is whether nonetheless, because they, only because they are non-parties. But, but the relevant question is whether the client had the dominant purpose. And, and nobody suggested, that there's, no, there's no suggestion that the dominant purpose test is not satisfied by, um, in respect to the documents over which it's been uh, asserted, on behalf of the clients, and that they had the relevant dominant purpose. Just what, um, just what is your submission on who the clients were? The clients, I made a note. Because <laughs> I thought my Lord might ask. I go through it. Um, Alan 9 at page 180 defines the client in a table of definitions as IDO, RAC development, and RAC. RF, um, the, then if you go in the same oh, sorry, I'm not, did you say 180? 180 is the definitions table. So page 180. Yes, sorry. Sorry. <coughs> um, and, and it's a convenient place for that is who we say the client was. It's an 
idea of separate was that does that mean this capacity as uh, representative of all emanations of the government? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure that it has a separate idea. Again, it appears to be not wrong in terms of the state emanation. I would need to check that if I'm wrong. Yeah. It's, it's, the, it's, it's the investment arm of the government. But does that mean effectively? Government on all emanations. Um, in effect, in effect, it's, it's a particular branch of the government that runs. Obviously. Um, but I sorry, I asked you a sign. I asked you a follow. Does that mean that, that, that the client is effectively all emanations of the government? Correct. That's not quite how we. Um, no. uh, No, no, my lord, we don't go as far as that. that because, for example, we, not, we, not we don't prosecutor. say public prosecutor is that. Um, I, I don't know how material this is, but what about the ruler? Well, I'm going to come to that, my lord. All right, the, client, okay. the, the, the ruler, we don't say, was the client. But if um, you go to, um, in the same bundle, to tab 36, 1415. Just one moment, sorry. So where, to where, sorry? Page 415, my lord. 415. Yes. So then that's my lord. 36, which is volume 2. matter of how it's presented in this letter, <coughs> the client is initially IDO and subsequently RAK development. And then when it's three, it says Decker also took instructions from the ruler. That, that it doesn't on. say on behalf of whom that is, but reading the two paras together, that would be on behalf of IDO and RAK developments. Is that right? One second. And just your note relating to the transfer to rack development that's dealt with in Mr. Allen's ninth witness statement at paragraph 30. Can I just see that? Yes. It's, um, page 122. So which paragraph? Paragraph 30. So I was on the wrong page. Page 122, my lord. Yes, sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's the letter itself suggests that's, that's replacement, it's not supplementation. No. And just before you leave this, on what basis is Rackius defined as a client? Can I come right back for a moment? Yes, of course. Thank 
phrase, unless I misheard, Rackley was underneath IDO. In the structure, IDO is the... Um, as well. But if IDO is, is, is not an independent legal entity, the same is true about Rackley, therefore. Um, well, Rackley is an independent legal entity. The sovereign wealth fund, in effect. IDO so in what sense is it underneath IDO? Does it mean that the directors are... Oh, I don't know. No, I, I'm, I'm doing my best. No, I see that. The, 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 um, uh, as I understand this, Rakhia is a sovereign wealth fund. Yes. And is a separate legal entity. No, I knew. Makes, makes its investment. IDO is effectively the government, um, or the branch of the government that is in charge of um, investments, um, and sits above that. That's the department of the government that sits above the sovereign wealth fund, which has yeah. a legal entity. Well, by one route or another, no doubt a perfectly proper route, it directs or has the power to direct Rackley what to do. I'd be cautious about how I answer. I, 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 I think Mr. Allen's not. Yes. 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 By, I mean, there are various perfectly legitimate ways simply by nominating the directors, the board, and so on. Yeah. I know. I just. Not suggesting anything wrong, just trying to get the. And then I think I have read this somewhere, but Rack Development is also a separate legal entity. Right. Well, it's an LLC. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Can I ask just one more question? When we say IDO is an emanation of the state, or to put it another way, the government of RAK, there's no distinction between the government of the RAK, RAK and the ruler. No legal distinction. Is that right? Uh, rather, as here, you might say the crown. Um, with this difference that I that, that I imagine was clear from the evidence, the ruler takes a much stronger personal. Uh, the ruler has no interest. constitutional role in um, uh, any of the clients. I see. Um, <coughs> I think that's the well. If there isn't evidence about this, I expect it's probably quite complicated. I think I, I asked think yesterday if there was good. evidence, and the answer is there isn't any evidence beyond what you've already told me. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, my back is getting. Um, uh, constitutionally, as I understand it, um, the ruler has no role in any of the three clients. But I can't help you all. No, but we do know that, that uh, and not necessarily in conflict with that, that um, they received instructions from him. But, uh, and, At some times. And authorised to give instructions um, uh, on their behalf, which is why we are taking instructions from the ruler. Yes, very well. Thank you. Um, cautious about saying it, but I think the other two points, um, one, Don't spend time on it now. I, just, I, I think it's because of the table that says these are the things that gave rise to the conclusion, the last of which is the interview with Mr. Gerard on the 9th. Well, the table doesn't say the 9th. The table doesn't say the 9th, I accept that. So it's, at some later stage, it was identified, whether expressly or by reference to it, and I was just wondering when that was. That's it. So um, it's a small point. Confirm it in writing. We'll do, my um, And then the final point of those three which again wasn't mentioned orally, is the question of whether um, litigation uh, could have been in reasonable contemplation before the formal uh, complaint was 
file. Um, and again, we've, we've said what we need to say. Um, there were a plethora of reasons why, before the filing of the, process, uh, the, the formal complaint, um, it could have been and was in reasonable contemplation, uh, which we've set out um, crucially. We had already been instructed, definitely instructed, not sometimes it's required. But Baker McKenzie had also been instructed prior to the arrest uh, of Mr. Sadek. Um, and they had been instructed in relation to the case in respect of which he was um, uh, then arrested uh, on the basis that they were caught into the leases case to which the prosecutor refers when they met with Mr. Sadek on the 10th. So it's clear that based upon um, the uh, prior Baker McKenzie report in the leases case, The report itself, the bacon again, what I should say is not in the bundle, but we don't have it. It's a privileged document. Um, so it's not one we have, but you can see all the references to it in the prosecution, um, in, in, in the document referring to the prosecutor putting the point to Mr. Sadek time and time again. He says, well, what do you say about what Baker McKenzie um, say about this is bad? Um, and at the end of that, um, um, so the we also have the point on there that what matters is actually what our, um, what the reasonable expectation was of the party claiming privilege. The reasonable contemplation was rather than the prosecution. Um, can I then um, I think finally turn to um, sorry, the only other point was Mr. Pierce's point. I think given no mention was made of it, um, we might even say that I'll just stand up and deal with it. Um, So that is the point about whether Three Rivers Number Five should be extended to um, litigation privilege. Um, uh, if you have any questions on that, do not I will not be here. Um, my lords, can I then finally turn uh, to uh, <coughs> legal advice privilege? Um, again, it's a relatively short one, uh, and it's one uh, which currently, as things stand. Is not a point of any great practical significance because we've claimed LAP over very few documents, with the vast majority of uh, privileged documents being subject in any event um, to LIP. Um, I'm not sure how I put that, but just to be clear, we have claimed LAP over quite a few documents, but there are very few over which that is the sole basis of. Unless you're against us on LIP, um, the LAP question doesn't doesn't isn't currently really acute. Um, there does not appear to be any uh, difference between the parties uh, as to the principles relating to uh, LAP, subject but not for this court to the Three Rivers Number um, Five point about client, um, uh, which is the subject of our cross appeal. Um, and we've set out those principles in our skeleton argument at paragraph 107. Um, uh, in, and I understood yesterday uh, that there wasn't anything between us on, on um, principles. I just ask you to remind yourselves that um, uh, of Sorry, forgive me, I was just writing something. Where, 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 where? where? 110, uh, four bundles.
more do they seek? Because we cannot, we're not allowed to claim privilege, even the vice privilege, over any documents or parts thereof which involve communications created for the dominant purpose of the defendant's investigatory work. In other words, it, it, that, that's the order that's sought, that's sought below and still sought. Um, if what that meant was that we're not allowed to claim privilege over any communications between the uh, defendants and their former clients created for the dominant purpose of what might be termed purely investigatory work, divorced from any relevant legal context, one would say that one can see this point. Um, but, but, but that does not appear to be um, the, ambition, the, the limit of the ambition. Um, um, it, it, it's difficult to identify on what basis, um, just stepping back from it, that order or anything you've heard said to you or in the, in the submissions, that order is um, sought. Um, the fact of the matter is, though, that the documents in respect of which LAP has been claimed Mr. Allen has said, were for the necessary dominant purpose, um, in other words, in a relevant legal context. And that has been done not, as it were, on a global <coughs> look at the engagements, and therefore everything must be, but on a document-by-document uh, document basis. And Mr. Allen explains that in Allen 9, paragraphs 142 to 143. If what the appellant is really asking you to conclude is that none of Deckert's investigatory work was for the dominant purpose necessary to attract LAP, despite the contrary evidence of Mr. Allen, whose team had looked at the documents. You say that no basis for uh, that conclusion is even articulated by the appellant, let alone evidence. And it would, uh, to put it no higher, be a highly surprising to reach in relation to a law firm being instructed to carry out a global investigation into a series of suspected frauds on RAC which lead to multiple pieces of litigation. That would be particularly so in the face of the engagement letters and the evidence given by Mr. Allen about Deckard's role in Allen 9 at paragraphs 12 to 66. In fact, despite the breadth of the order sought, there are only three points we can identify that have been made, none of which would come even close to justifying the conclusion or orders uh, suggested, even if the premise of the relevant point was made good, which it isn't. The first point is the point um, in the skeleton argument, the appellant skeleton argument of paragraph 95, about Deckert's uh, role in assisting the Iraq public prosecutor. My learned friend rightly took that point uh, lightly. I say rightly because there is no basis at all for concluding that whatever assistance we gave to the public prosecutor means that any part of our investigation was taken outside of and was not for the dominant purpose of the relevant legal advisory context in which we were acting for our former clients. Still less, as the order suggests, all of it was. We say it is perfectly orthodox part of the role of a lawyer acting for its clients to act as Decker did. And the suggestion made uh, that something more unusual that steps outside of the role of a lawyer um, is difficult to understand. A reference was made to a document in the further evidence bundle at page, page 243 and the suggestion was that that shows that something um, uh, more than assisting the prosecution was happening. In fact, the document showed exactly the opposite of that. I'll just remind you, um, you've taken to it, it's page 243. So sorry, I picked up the wrong one, but just give me a second.
still picked up the wrong button. That's unlucky. Which bundle of sugar would it be? It's the further evidence bundle. I was looking at further evidence. Sorry. Yes. We've taken to this, um, and um, the reference is made to the bit in the middle of the paragraph where it says Decker was asked, Decker firm was asked to run the prosecution. Um, so, but you didn't need to read on. Um, they did not understand this. They, they the prosecutor, did not understand this was unacceptable and untenable. Um, and you read on. That's not what happened because Decker obviously wouldn't do it. Not least because of the correspondence. No, sure, surely what is unacceptable and untenable is what comes before asking Deckard, namely that the prosecutor in um, RAK was not up to the job. Uh, that may have been part of it, but if my Lord reads on, after the palace registered the anger at the lack of capability and motivation to prosecute the problem, it was a sign that was probably necessary to bring in a prosecutor from outside RAC. So what was not happening, which appeared to be suggested yesterday, is that Deckard did take over the well, they were asked to bring the case to the prosecutor's office on a golden platter. As my lord, we said that that is a perfectly proper thing to do for the client acting in a normal legal advisory capacity. Um, and there is nothing, there's nothing untoward about that. Um, I, I've, I've made the points already that, that the, um, uh, um, that, that we, we did have to help. Decker did have to help the prosecutor because this was a complicated case um, in, in which uh, the prosecutor um, needed uh, assistance, and Decker provided that. As the evidence shows, um, that ev uh, uh, assistance was provided uh, by Decker um, in the period really up until December 2014, after which it, it fell off because Altimimi thereafter, um, the local law firm, uh, took, took over. Um, so the interactions after that point. Um, and um, nothing about the job that was being done by Deckard means that the privilege of the client uh, was lost. And indeed, Deckard was at pains to say, we can only help um, uh, 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 up to a point that avoids losing our client. Sorry, yes, up to the point um, uh, at which we might otherwise lose privilege. Um, the um, other... Sorry, but if, if, if your main submission is right, namely that it's perfectly legitimate to help a local prosecutor, whether it's legitimate or not, it's certainly legal advice. Yes. Um, it's acting on behalf of the client, the document. Act, oh, yes. yes. Um, uh, what, what, why exactly. would privilege be lost? No. Well, uh, uh, once you hand things over to the and we've accepted <coughs> that our actual communications where we give anything to the public prosecutor, um, we lost privilege at that point. I see. Because of and, the, and we've handed yeah, I, I, over, got we've disclosed everything that we communicate to the public prosecutor. Yeah. Um, but, but, but that doesn't unwrap the things that happen um, and that, that lead to the production of what we share with the prosecutor. It's a confidentiality point. Yeah, you yes. lose exactly. it at the confidentiality. Exactly. Con confidentiality is lost. Exactly. And that's the later stage. Because yes. that's all you risk. Can I just take you back um, to paragraph 108 of your skeleton? Because I'm not sure if I've understood that. Page 110. <laughs> you, say, you say that um, uh, paragraph 108, while there will be many documents which are in fact subject to LAP, the vast majority also covered by LIP, and then you say, for reasons of proportionality, therefore, where a document was identified as being subject to LIP, the respondents did not spend additional time assessing whether it was also subject to LAP. Yes. Now, I'd understood that as meaning that you um, simply hadn't applied your minds to legal advice privilege, where you identified that there was a valid claim for litigation privilege. <coughs> Although I'm not sure that's the same as what you said a little no, while ago. It, it, but the it, consequence it, of that, no. if, if right, would be that 
if we were to be against you on mitigation privilege for any of the reasons which Oppenheimer says we should be, um, then legal advice privilege has not has not been considered no. at all. Is, is that uh, right? I'm, I'm sorry. I, I thought I, I I meant to make that very clear at the outset. This point is currently of no moment, and it's only if you choose find against me on LIP that the um, LAP point, um, as it were, um, becomes important. And that's because we will then need to go and do a re-review um, for those documents over which we had currently claimed only LIP to see whether they do attract LAP, because we haven't applied our minds to those documents. Uh, and we'll need to know whether we can claim LAP. Um, right. so it, despite all, despite all the that, time, it's called back, back, back to square one. I think my lord is about to well, possibly, me. Possibly, since you haven't claimed LAP for them, that's it. Um, no, no, my lord. Um, we've been very clear. Um, that I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So there are documents over which we. Um, the reason you can see reference here to us having considered it in more cases, and that's why I qualified what I said. We have considered LAP in um, in many cases because we eventually were asked to do a redaction. Um, and we produced a redaction blog, and in that we do specify, we, we did the exercise for both columns. We picked whether it's LIP and or yeah. LAP. Um, so in many cases, we have done the exercise, but we have been very clear from the outset um, that um, we um, LAP may well um, exist in relation to numerous, but the easy category was to simply deal with the LIP, um, and that's the basis of what we've done. And I certainly wouldn't accept my lord. Um, I don't know whether... I certainly don't accept for a moment. I mean, what I was, what I was putting to you was, it, it, it may be argued that insofar as you haven't done the LAP exercise independently, there may be a question as to the appropriate remedy if we reach this point in all the forks in the road. Well, I'm as sure to whether you should, be given, yes. you should be given a further opportunity or whether actually you've had your opportunity to fail well, LAP. You know what I'll say to that, my Lord, but really? I'm certain we'll be faced with the argument now that my Lord's raised it. <laughs> um, given, given the communications that have taken place over time, um, and, and the point at this point has been squarely raised on a number of occasions that that, that is the position, and we would have to do a re-review for LAP. Um, yes. well, actually, what I was going to suggest was, if it's a point on what the consequences of our judgment should be, it maybe it's something you should be allowed to address on each side, uh, as and when those consequences are apparent. I'm, I'm only speaking for myself, but I, I raised it in, in a sense as a precursor to saying. Well, I know. I think you're speaking for me as well. I think let's see if we get to this situation at all. Um, what is then uh, the right way of handling the consequences of the decision in terms of what your remedy is, if rem <coughs> their remedy is? Um, I haven't quite finished on LAP, but can no. I say this? I, I, this is not one of those cases um, in our respectful submission which once you've done a judgment, the consequential, the, 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 as it were, the order that you make can, as it were, just be done probably in the usual way in the Court of Appeal, um, but, but, but by, um, in, in writing. Um, the the, the, the um, way in which, for example, to craft any order, if you were against me on any of the points, will need to be the subject of real discussion. Um, there are a number of permutations um, some of the drafting of the current proposed order is, we say, plainly inapposite, even if I lost on um, some of the points. A and no alternative proposal has ever been put forward. Um, so one would need to craft carefully if there are things where you say uh, we need to do more, or indeed where we've got it wrong, um, what the consequences of that will be. And um, uh, we would respectfully caution, uh, as it were, against trying to fashion an order that comes as part of um, the judgment, as opposed to um, working out its ramifications. Well, I doubt if we would do that, but we will bear that in mind. Um, the more likely situation is that, uh, as it were, in the usual way, you will be asked to either agree an order and it will be that that's not likely to happen, and therefore we will have to decide between rival submissions and may even have to have a short further hearing. But let's see. We may not go there. Um, 
my, my lords, um, uh, just finishing LAP um, or, or, or moving towards that point. Um, uh, the second point made is that the judge placed too much weight on the engagement letters. Um, the short answer he, is, is that he didn't. He certainly took them into account, um, as he was entirely justified uh, in doing. And indeed, the JET 2 case makes it clear that that is a good starting point. Um, but he also considered, as his judgment makes clear at paragraphs 136 to 138, the evidence of both Mr. Siafalu and Mr. Allen as regards the role of Deckert, and weighing that all up, he concluded that there was no basis um, for making the order sought in relation to LAP. And we say that evaluation of the evidence was right uh, and, and certainly um, not wrong in the relevant sense uh, for appeal. The final point which the appellant uh, makes, which is not uh, in the um, uh, its skeleton argument uh, for the appeal, but is made in one of the supplementary skeletons related to further evidence, is, is that that further evidence shows that Deckert's role Included significant components falling outside the relevant, uh, the scope of a relevant legal context. Reference is made to a political dispute, a concern about uh, Dr. Massa's competing business interests, and a negative PR campaign by the ruler against Dr. Massa. Um, uh, and that was said orally yesterday, and it's also in their skeleton uh, supplementary further evidence skeleton argument, paragraphs 12 to 13. We address this point in our supplementary further evidence skeleton of paragraph 7. Um, uh, uh, we don't accept that the documents do show what they are said to show. There may have been bits and pieces uh, that related to such matters, but there is no evidence that they were a significant part of the role of Deckert, and certainly nothing to suggest that the dominant purpose of the investigation carried out was a non-legal context in which communications between Deckert and its former client sponsor tract LAP. There is nothing to suggest either that where Enyo have made their document by document uh, assessment, which as I say is not a blanket assessment by reference to an overarching purpose, but by looking at the particular document, um, uh, nothing to suggest that they have got that assessment wrong. And just to take, for example, the specific PR point, I've made this point already, but I'll finish with it. Um, Allen 9, paragraph 115, um, uh, quoting from Allen 3, at paragraph 34, confirms that communications about a PR strategy have not been treated as privileged. Um, so Mr. Allen has applied the very approach that it is said he should uh, apply, um, and where something is not as part of the relevant, uh, for a relevant uh, legal purpose, for the dominant purpose, satisfying the test, um, but privilege has not uh, been claimed. So, um, my lords, um, those are the points uh, that I need to deal with. Um, uh, I will see whether you have anything, unless you have anything else, or anything else. Um, unless you have anything else for me, um, I'll let Mr. Skid um, be grilled on three orders number five. Uh, can I just ask something about the litigation generally? Um, I think we saw in the context of the press evidence application that the delay in producing the judgment resulted in the trial date being lost twice, but it now seems that um, there's possibly quite a further extensive round of pleading still to happen, and I just wondered what's been happening in the litigation, as it were, outside of this appeal, if anything, and what stage you have got to. Um, two, two, two points, my lord. First, it would not be fair to say that the delay in the privilege judgment was the only reason for the loss of the dates. Um, there were other reasons. It was a factor. I think that's a fair, um, fair, uh, fair reflection of where it was. So it would be unfair to say that um, that, that was the cause. Um, second, um, the, it is fair to say that, that there has not been much progress um, since the. Uh, the, uh, the April think of this year, I'm now getting lost, the April of this year trial dates came out of the diaries. Um, nobody has sought to refix the case uh, or to have a further CMC to look at progress. 
Um, the claimant has, as I've already said, indicated that it wishes to amend, um, it further amend its particulars. In particular, we don't know whether this is limited to, but in particular, as we understand it, in relation to the hacking evidence. Um, and as my Lord knows, that arrived in dribs and drabs. Um, and so um, it has received some since it first uh, put in the, 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 the um, current version. Um, pending that, it was agreed that we wouldn't serve an amended defense dealing to what uh, was already um, uh, uh, amended, um, nor anything else that we needed to deal with uh, in the defense. Um, and uh, on, at that point, I think that's as far as anybody has got to. No trial has been uh, listed um, for this case. Um, uh, there are, um, as the court may know, um, uh, the Azima proceedings are taking place. Uh, the trial, uh, which um, the, the, the retrial of those issues is taking place in, well, not the retrial, I'm sorry, I said that wrong, but the, the, the trial in the Azima proceedings is taking place, I think, in April, May. May, May next year um, through to through to July, um, uh, and um, obviously that involves um, uh, some of the DECA um, parties. Um, uh, as to um, what happens next in this case, I, I wouldn't want to hazard. I wouldn't want to say any. I, I can't really say any more. Um, there has not been correspondence, as far as I am aware, about next steps as well. I think. At this point, people are waiting to see what happens uh, on the privilege issues. And it's, it's obvious that if, um, contrary to everything I've said, um, we need to revisit any part of privilege, uh, the, the disclosure, um, that is going to cause um, another exercise. Um, there may indeed, depending upon um, the, the way in which you decide it, one or other party might wish to appeal to the Supreme Court. Um, and depending upon the point, that may or may not um, have a prospect of um, finding its way there. And we've had no witness statements, presumably, in this action. Witness statements haven't yet been served on the date. Uh, uh, so a trial yeah. now is quite a long way in the future. A trial now is, is with it realistically a, a considerable way off. It, it was, I think, um, agreed, uh, the latest estimate was 16 weeks. Um, and uh, that, that is not likely to happen any time soon, even if um, one started to the process right now. But as I say, between now, um, any judgment that you produce, the possibility of an appeal to the Supreme Court, um, and um, uh, then if any further disclosure has to be given, um, uh, you know, we obviously say it won't be, and therefore that won't be an impediment. But if, if it did, then there would be need to be that exercise. The witness statements would need to be re-looked at, um, and we're quite a long way. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. And, and is it a joint trial with the Kuzma proceedings, or is it a joint trial proceedings? with the Kuzma proceedings? Um, and it's um, uh, and um, we haven't had these fights in the Kuzma proceedings. That's another point: is that this is, um, as it were, a, a, a tester um, uh, potentially. Um, uh, I don't know what, again, I won't say more about that, no. um, but, but, but there are also the related Stoko proceedings. Stoko have a claim in their, are bringing a claim in their own name in relation to the post-commencement alleged interference with the conduct of these proceedings. Um, and that claim, too, has been joined to um, Kuzma. Well, I think, especially with I think we've learnt as much as we know, as much as we need about uh, the litigation context. Anything else? No, I think Mr. Pierce is spared. Well, no. <coughs> my, my lords, I, I wasn't prepared, given the time, my learned friend needs a time to reply. I wasn't proposing to say anything at all about the two issues that have been left to, left to me, unless your lordships would like to hear from me about Well, them. I understood that to be um, uh, what was being proposed, and we agree. I'm, great. But I'm sorry to deprive <laughs> us of the pleasure of hearing you on the points. Um, my Lord, in my reply, I'm going to deal 
other than two points on litigation provision, I'm going to deal exclusively with the iniquity um, ground of challenge. Um, just can I deal, as it were, one piece of housekeeping. You'll have seen that Mr. Paul kind of emailed you the decision whose name escaped me yesterday when I was having exchanges. Oh, with yes, I wonder what it was. I didn't put two and two together. Thank you. Um, yes, we have that. That was, that was in the context of the discussion about whether um, the, a distinction should be made about the application of the iniquity exception in cases uh, where the iniquity is concerned with the conduct <coughs> of the litigation. And I think that would, the decision was the one I had in mind, that actually there might be more difficult considerations. And I was also conscious that in view of what your Lordships have said about the guidance that you intend to be giving, that it would be unfortunate if you weren't aware of a really relatively recent Court of Appeal decision on the iniquity exception. Thank you. Obviously citing um, my Lord or Justice Bob Royal's judgment extensively in that. Um, my Lords, can I um, address you on a sort of issue of background to the um, iniquity application? Because I think it's important to understand, particularly in light of my learned friend's reliance on the fact that we've only focused on three elements of iniquity. I think you need to understand how this uh, application arose. And I just, if, if I may, just walk you through the relevant passages of uh, the witness statement. Um, we first have Mr. Allen's third witness statement, which was his witness statement that accompanied uh, the defendant's disclosure in May 2021. And that witness statement is in your supplementary bundle one behind tab four. And there are just three paragraphs there with where Mr. Allen deals with iniquity. If you turn to bundle four of the bundle. leave you to read paragraphs 47 to 50. <coughs> Page. One, 104. Thank you. Considered that information was uh, unsatisfactory and they didn't give enough information. So we sought an order requiring them to provide more information. And that <coughs> resulted in the service of Alan Four, an extract of which you find behind the next tab, um, beginning at 107. Um, but the relevant page paragraphs dealing with the iniquity exception, <coughs> you'll see at 109 and 110. Again, may I just leave you to. to glance at those. I should preface that by saying that they initially said we weren't um, entitled to know more and then we sought that direction so they provided this confirmation and that resulted in the list that you've then uh, uh, when you say this confirmation where uh, I can uh, the last sentence of 53 so what do you mean well um, th they we said what you provided in Ireland 3 isn't satisfactory yeah I've, I've seen possible. all that no I just I wasn't clear what confirmation you meant, but I don't know. Well, I, the, the listing out the categories of inequity, <coughs> or the categories that they accepted would engage, the categories of conduct which they accepted would in principle engage the inequity exception. Yeah. Um, in, in making our application, we took that, that list and had to assess against what they can, accepted would amount to uh, iniquity for the purposes of the exception. We then assessed in a normal way as a litigant would 
um, the evidence that we then needed in order to uh, uh, meet the evidential hurdle on such an application. But the application has always proceeded on the basis of and premised on our pleaded case, which, as my Lord, Lord Justice Popperwell observed, has always been that notwithstanding one can divide up certain categories of iniquity, the overriding purpose of all those iniquities was the same um, and has always been part of uh, Mr. al Sadek's case. So that's Paris 9 and 10, in particular. Uh, is my Lord talking about Yorks and the pleading? Yes. Yeah, uh, not not only. Uh, I mean, the I, I apologise. I, I think I jumped off at that point. But there were a number of other paragraphs which set out the point, particularly if one considers that nine and ten are really just the. Yes, no, they were prefatory, but prefatory. They, I thought. And then they... there are the ones in more detail. Yeah. Twenty nine being, I think, probably the key one. I think the other one I got up to mention was a later one, but twenty nine. I would ask you to look at. Now, can I then turn to this focus that my learned friend uh, made about, well, it's, the court has to bear in mind that there are only these three iniquities that the appellant has chosen to um, make reference to in uh, his application. And um, as I understood it, the point being made was that this somehow limited us in how we are then able to satisfy the evidential burden in relation to limb two of the text. Um, although it's not quite clear to me how, but that somehow it's more difficult for us then to establish the overarching purpose because we've only focused on these three categories of iniquity. Um, now, can I, again, sorry for going into this in a bit of detail, but can I show you what Mr. Chatterloo says about the reason for focus on these particular categories of iniquity? And you, that you'll find in his sixth witness statement, uh, page 32 of this one. Um, yes. And he, he refers to the categories at paragraph 55. And then if you could then just read what he says at paragraphs 56 and 57. surprising about the fact, and indeed might be thought to be obvious, that Mr. al Sadek in his application has focused on areas where in the light of the materials that Mr. Chatterloo refers to, the court should be able to have confidence that the relevant evidential burden has been discharged. There are, of course, other alleged iniquities that, um, that are listed there, but um, again, just looking at them, they might be said to, to, to be ones which would engage a, a uh, much more contentious factual dispute or might directly impugn upon the defendant's conduct and on, as such impinge upon the key substantive issues for trial. And in those cases, establishing the prima facie case or the strong prima facie case might be considered to be less straightforward. So in my submission, it's entirely reasonable and appropriate for Mr. al -Sadek to have focused on certain categories of iniquity for the purpose of this uh, interlocutory application given the evidential requirements upon him. And, uh, and as I said earlier, that shouldn't place him at some disadvantage evidentially in making uh, uh, good his case. Um, and it was appropriate to approach the question of iniquity in this case by reference to the specific categories which the defendant said they had applied in conducting their disclosure review. And for Mr. Alcidek to consider, in the light of the disclosure that had been provided, where it appeared that the defendants had gone particularly or most obviously wrong in their assessment. And then the only other point I would add is that, of course, the respondents have always said, uh, and my, I believe my learned friend uh, 
said something of, of, of this nature uh, yesterday, that the respondents have always been alive, they say, to all forms of inequity. Now, well, as that takes me um, to my next point about we, we are advancing some sort of new case uh, on this appeal. My learned friend placed front and centre in his submissions that the proposition that our, that our case, that the purpose of unlawfully detaining Mr. Asadek and subjecting him to these various conditions and access to legal representation was to procure his cooperation with the investigation. Now, my lords, this is not a new case. It, the way we put the case now was specifically flagged as part of our appeal on ground four. Um, and uh, I think you, you, you were uh, uh, referred to a passage in the uh, grounds of appeal. Um, which sorry. Uh, yes. We referred to a passage in the what? The, sorry, a paragraph in our grounds of appeal where we set this out expressly that this was a, a respect in which the judge erred. Can we see that? taken to, though, was our appendix at the back, which was the various submissions we said that were not addressed by the judge. If you go to page 24, please, and in the, the second uh, entry of the table there. By way of further example, the appellant relied, does it? Sorry, the judge did not address. The oh, second, sorry, sorry the second, second box. Deck, second box. How is that point consistent with the court not needing to be concerned with Deckard's involvement in the inequity? Can I come back to the involvement? I want to address you specifically on the involvement point. Can I come to that next? Okay. Um, so, so, and this... Um, to which ground did this appendix well, well where is it referred to in the rest of the um, in, in the substantive grounds in relation to, de to delay um, on page 20 I see well, that's why you refer to ground 4 yes I see um, I, I, I won't take you to them but if the, the transcript references that you have there to submissions I I made below. Um, they are in the, the ones at day one are in the bundle. Let me give you the references in case you'd like to look at them. It's the first reference is uh, page um, uh, supplementary bundle tab thirty eight pages four hundred and thirty to four hundred and thirty one. The second <coughs> reference is, is the next page at four hundred and thirty two. We don't have I think day two in the um, in the supplementary bundle, but all I did there, I think, was referred back to what I'd said on day one. So it's not a, a new case. Um, even if it were a new way of framing matters, it's not clear to us where this takes my learned friend. If I make um, well, one point I've already made, which is it's, it's in our ground of appeal, in ground 1.7. Second point, it reflects Mr. Alcidek's pleaded case. Um, Third point, contrary to my learned friend's submission, there is ample evidence to make good that case before this court, as there was before the judge, and you have the references uh, in the evidence uh, note. And, and then the fourth is the one I've already made, which is that the respondents have always said that they were alive to all forms uh, of iniquity. Um, we say, my lords, just to finish on the evidence and my evidence note, picking up a discussion earlier with that you had with my learned friends, we say on the basis of the evidence. So when you say your evidence note, I mean slow. What do you mean? I mean, sorry, the list of references that I had. For the, the oh, that note. Yes, so sorry. Of course, I see what you mean. Yep. Um, we say, having regard to all the materials, and I obviously highlighted to you the, the key 
ones as I was able to, we say that on the basis of all of that evidence, when you look at it all together, it is an inescapable inference that the purpose of uh, Mr. Arsadek's treatment was to secure his cooperation uh, with the investigation. Now, can I deal with uh, the point that was just raised uh, uh, by my uh, Lord or Justice Males about involvement? It is, of course, again, another repeated theme of my learned friend's submissions that the fundamental premise of our applications is that the defendants had no involvement in iniquities. Now, I, I accept, of course, that Mr. Chatterloo's sixth witness statement Makes, discusses this and he refers to the fact of involvement. <coughs> but again, I'm sorry, we probably need to go back to this. You need to see what uh, exactly Mr. Chatterloo says in his witness statement there. Uh, but just, just to, to preface the point before you read it, what we, what we have never said is that the defendants were not in any way factually involved. What we were saying was that it is not a necessary part of our application to establish that the defendant's involvement, whatever it was, was sufficient to make them liable for the conduct. In other words, it has never been part of uh, our application that we uh, it be necessary for us or the court to find that Deckert was culpable in some way. But we have never said, and we're not saying now, that they weren't involved factually in some shape or form. And that's the, the pick up the point of my Lord Lord Justice Popperwell. Obviously, in innocent solicitor cases, um, there's involvement by the solicitor. And that is the, always been the sense in which we use the term. Yes, but it, it rather relates to, 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 to the point you were previously addressing, which is that you have focused on three iniquities uh, on, on the part of the clients, in which it isn't evident that they were involved in any sense. Rendition conditions of detention, denial of legal representation. Well, I, I think again... Uh, sorry, my lord. No, you go first. But that, 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 spelling out the obvious point, there's no obvious decadence involvement in that, whereas the next tranche, which are the ones you... Mr. Chatelou says... I forget what the exact phrase is, but he's not focusing on in this application, do directly involve decadence, though... Uh, you rightly say, it could easily be on an innocent basis, namely asking the questions. Well, my lord, I still say that if you're satisfied on, on the evidence that I make out the, the evidential burden, that, that is, and if you're satisfied that you can make the what I say is an ines inescapable inference, then uh, that is sufficient, and one doesn't need to concern <coughs> oneself about um, whether um, there was specific involvement in Deckert being there to uh, uh, at the point that uh, that uh, there was the unlawful rendition took place. Um, if there are communications in which they're involved that um, I use the word um, relate to here, not because I suggest that's the test, but in some way you reach the view that there is a category of communications that should be captured, then it, it, it doesn't matter that, um, <coughs> again, that the role of the, the innocent solicitor, if Deckert is somehow involved in communicating about these forms of iniquity, which ultimately satisfy uh, the, the test that they are a part of or in, in furtherance, that is enough. So I, I think, in my submission, the point about involvement um, has perhaps in that way taken on too great a significance, because it's clear that the way the iniquity exception uh, is meant to operate is that the involvement can be quite inadvertent, if you like. I'm sorry, I am um, because you were trailing the, the point before you took us to yes, it. Yes, I'm you, sorry. You were going to take, take us, us to the passages of no. let you read those. Sorry, my lord. Um, supplementary bundle, uh, page 31. Um, and could you read? Um, this, the focus has always been on the words at the bottom of 52, where they, Mr. Chatterloo uses the word involvement. But if you read 50, 51, and 52, then hopefully that makes good the point I've just been making. So 50, 50, 51, and 52. Sorry.
also have to see 56, don't you? <coughs> Mr. Sadek does not address each of these categories and reserves his position in relation to those which he does not address. And the ones he relies on are the first three, and the ones where he reserves his position are um, the remaining ones. So, so the application is plainly not founded on other than the first three, according to Mr. Sadley. Well, I, in my submission, that needs to be uh, read in light of what I've already outlined about making good the claim, uh, making good the evidential burden. Um, but if you're satisfied that the evidential burden is made out in respect of um, uh, those three categories, then any anything that is made, uh, documents that are that fall within the overarching purpose on the basis of what we've, we've established there, having regard to those uh, categories of iniquity, then um, that should result in an order um, for disclosure. Now, I can see that there might be um, other categories, specifically, for example, in relation to hacking, which um, uh, might not op might themselves require, um, particularly in relation to the newer materials. I, don't, I think we accept that if there's to be another set of disclosure coming out of that, then it's likely we're going to have to, subject to what will be provided, we need to make a new application. But in my submission, this doesn't, um, the fact that we've focused on these categories of iniquity, for the reasons that, are, that I've explained, doesn't then entitle uh, my learned friend, at least, to take the, inv he invites you to take an approach where you just need to look very narrowly, was there involvement by Deckard in these specific categories of iniquity? And if there wasn't, that's the end of the story. You don't need to worry about overarch overarching purpose because we haven't properly made that out on the evidence. That, in my submission, is an extraordinarily narrow and inappropriate approach to take. <coughs> You, you, you say, do you? If you establish the relevant threshold uh, that the three iniquities took place uh, and that uh, it was the purpose of the right, the use of expression, that they should take place, it inevitably follows that that was an iniquitous purpose because the only Mr. Ely then says, well, that's, he doesn't accept that. In any event, that doesn't get you as far as an iniquitous purpose to extract false evidence, which is, a, is a, an additional yeah. aspect yes. of it, and you haven't bitten that off. So I, I can see that one. I think it would, I think ine inevitably, if I am, if I were to succeed on this application in any respect, then it's likely, in the light of any guidance that you give, that my learned friends will need to revisit the disclosure in any event. It may be that they, they, they might be able to conclude that there are aspects of conduct that, where they consider that there's still not a, strong, a prima facie, a strong prima facie case made out. Um, but I think it's... Um, it's a very difficult question to answer in the abstract without knowing what my lords are going to say about the guidance generally. I think it's likely that it, if my application is to succeed, it must be on the basis that they've taken too narrow an approach. If they've taken a too narrow an approach there, they're going to have to reconsider all of it. Well, can I make some submissions on the in individual inequities? Um, Unlawful detention. Now, my learned friend uh, made the point yesterday that the absence, and again today, the absence of a formal extradition request doesn't tell you anything, because it's possible that Rack and Dubai proceed on the basis of some more informal practice, despite what uh, the uh, law says. And I, that was yesterday, page 151, lines 8 to 10, 
He said the much more likely inference is that in practice by 2014, it is simply not the way in which the Emirates worked as between them. There was cooperation. Miles, this is a bad point for a number of reasons. First of all, it's come out of nowhere. It's not a point that my learned friends raised in response uh, to the application. Um, and if it's to be suggested that there's some practice in the UAE of informal extradition in the Emirates, then one would expect them to produce some evidence on this in response. But there isn't any such evidence. Second point, it's not reflective of the parties pleaded cases on this and the common ground that has emerged as to the UAE law requirement. Um, if I may, I'll just give you the pleading references for that. Uh, Mr. al Particulars of Claim, paragraph 40, Supplementary Bundle, tab 11, page 213. Um, and just so you, so you know, he says there that any constituent emirate wishing to question a person in relation to an offence who is not present in the emirate must make a request to the authorities in the emirate where the person is present for their arrest by the authorities in that emirate. And my learned friends admit that as the law of the UAE. That's paragraph 45 of the defence, page uh, supplementary bundle, tab 12, page 252. Um, let's remember as well, my lords, that it's not just the absence of an extradition request that made Mr. al Sadek's arrest, we say, unlawful. The requirements of a lawful extradition included uh, that the arrest is carried out by the authorities in the Emirate from which the extradition is sought, which obviously makes sense in circ circumstances which each Emirate have their own police and security forces. Now, my learned friend took you to various um, passages in the pleadings where he said it wasn't common ground uh, that uh, Mr. al Sadek was detained uh, by. Uh, by RAC authorities. Um, and he took you, um, I think, to uh, his defence as to the fact that it was their understanding that Mr. Al Sadek was apprehended by Dubai police prior to being detained. If, if, again, for your, your, my Lord's reference, that was paragraph 48 of their defence, supplementary bundle, tab 12, pages 252 to 253. Now, what Mr. Eady did not show you was that there, uh, we put an RFI in, and one of the, we asked for um, information as to the basis for that understanding, and they declined to answer it. The reference for that is Supplementary Bundle, Tab 13, page 271. It's response 33, and they say, uh, the request is not confined to matters which are reasonably necessary and proportionate for the claimant to understand the case he has to meet. They just declined to answer, give any reason for the basis of that understanding. So we say, whatever the position regarding the absence of an extradition request is a document, the fact that Mr. Asadek was detained, we say, by the RAP authorities, and there's nothing really to suggest that that is not correct, um, it, it, that establishes a strong prima facie case that the detention was unlawful. My lords, I'd also ask you not to forget the evidence of Mr. Al Haddad, uh, Mr. Al Haddad's UAE lawyer, who was himself uh, a police officer and public prosecutor in Dubai and would therefore know about such matters. He's given evidence in his third witness statement uh, that Mr. Al Haddad uh, was detained in Dubai by the RAC state security. That's paragraph seven of his witness statement. Supplementary bundle, tab 9, page 200. And the respondent served <coughs> no evidence in response to dispute that contention. And my Lord, Lord Justice Popwell asked, when was it that we served that witness statement? It was served on the 6th of December, and the hearing was on the 20th and the 21st of December. So my Lord, um, my learned friends overlook the fact that the unlawfulness had several components, not simply the absence of the extradition request. And there's also the fact that Mr. al Sadek was not presented to a public prosecutor within the 24-hour period prescribed by UAE law. That's paragraph 49 of our particulars of claim. Uh, supplementary bundle, tab 11, page 215. And the defendants do not admit that in paragraph 49 of their defence. 
supplementary bundle, tab 12, page 253. Ms. Oppenheimer, just noticing sorry. the time. Well, no, don't be sorry. I'm just, just, we're not going to sit beyond 4.30. I will be through. No, fine. I just didn't want you to... Thank you, thank you for the warning, my lord. Um, and one, one final point on the unlawfulness of detention. Um, let's remember that the defendant's case is that litigation privilege... Uh, it, I'm now turning to the litigation privilege context because it's relevant uh, for this ground of iniquity. They say, uh, if you remember row three of Mr. Allen's table, that for the purposes of the uh, criminal proceedings um, against uh, Mr. Al Sadek, that their case is that the litigation privilege uh, anticipation of that runs from the date of uh, the interview that Mr. Gerard undertook on the 9th of September. Now, my lords, in our submission, that would tend to confirm the unlawfulness of his initial detention, because it suggests that at the date he was detained, there was no reasonably contemplated criminal proceedings. My lords, um, I'm not going to say anything. Uh, I'm, I'm going to address one point on the uh, primary material, which is um, relevant on conditions. Um, Um, we, there was some discussion earlier um, today about the primary material that, that uh, uh, NEO disclosed, obviously the records of discussions that were had between Deckett and uh, Mr. Arthur Deck, but also records detailing the conditions in which the claimant was kept in prison. Now, um, as we understand it, we're told that the rationale is, is more or less the same for both, no real confidentiality, because effectively it's matters known to the claimant. So as we understand it, it must follow that the parts of the documents which record the conditions um, are, are to be regarded uh, effectively as records of fact, uh, of which Mr. al Sadek would have been aware, and that's why they've been disclosed. And that's important, we say, uh, for two reasons. It must be inherent in that approach that those um, records that you have of the conditions are to be regarded as true records. So, for example, um, we have uh, the, the unredacted materials we have aren't simply limited to statements about what Mr. Al Sadek has said about his conditions, but they also record, for example, what, what Mr. Mitchell's uh, report said. Now, if the primary material of that nature is to be regarded as true records of the conditions of Mr. al detention, it's very hard to see how the defendants can say that the evidential threshold is not met. <coughs> um, and secondly, my lords, we say it's in our submission remarkable that despite the disclosure of those materials detailing the conditions, the respondents have concluded uh, that not a single document uh, formed part of those uh, iniquities, and we say something gone wrong there. And can I make a connected point about uh, the significance of non-admissions uh, that was raised in, in discussions with my learned friend yesterday? Um, we do say that this is a case, particularly in the light of the disclosure that has emerged concerning conditions of detention, that the defendant's non-admissions are not a neutral factor. Um, it is very surprising, we say, that they uh, have elected to not admit uh, Mr. al Sadek's case about his conditions of detention, and that includes the aspects of his conditions of detention at al Barirat. And you'll see Defendant's Amended Defence, uh, uh, paragraph 93, page 259 uh, of the supplementary bundle. They say the allegations regarding the conditions at al Barirat uh, uh, are not admitted. Um, can I just briefly then deal with third category uh, of iniquity legal representation. Um, my lords, in my submission, the construction of the various documents that you were shown this, this morning that my uh, learned friend is, is uh, um, inviting you to uh, uh, draw from those is strained to say the very least. And I just need to clarify uh, three points for you. Can I deal first with the Bell Pottinger uh, documents? And again, I've just time to give you the references. 
But you'll recall that my learned friend relies on a note. Uh, sorry, you <coughs> sorry? Okay. I thought you were going to give us the references. I, I, I am. Oh, Can sorry. I just explain? There's a chronology here. Let, and you were taken to the document. That you may not understand the chronology in, in, on this issue. Bell Potting, Pottinger, who are giving PR advice. You, you will have seen the note that I that we refer to. We say it's very clear that he was being denied, where it says denied um, uh, access. I can't remember exactly where. No access to legal advice. That is a note of a meeting that took place in February 2015. The document is supplementary bundle, tab 27, page 367. Um, and we say that that it must what be. What date did you say? Twenty. It's February twenty fifteen. Thank I'll, you. No, that's fine. Um, and we say that is the meeting at which the discussion with the PR people is is, is obviously part of the discussion about what the <coughs> PR is going to then be. The note that my learned friend relies on is a sometime a month later. It's described in Mr. Allen's witness statement, that Allen nine, paragraph seventy nine two page 142 of the supplementary bundle, is described as some of the media briefing papers. Um, Mr. Chatterloo explains in his uh, ninth witness statement, paragraph 44.1, uh, paragraph, sorry, page 194 of the supplementary bundle, um, he explains why this cannot possibly be what is said there, a reliable source of evidence. In other words, that there's some... Um, voluntary basis on which, which Mr. Al-Sadek has decided not to get legal advice. These are media briefing papers. There are clearly the inferences, this is the briefing that is going to be given to the media, that it's on a voluntary basis, because the, what we've seen has happened a month <coughs> earlier actually reflects what was discussed with Bell Pottinger. So I'd ask you just to look at those documents in, in that order. Um, the uh, next point I need to show you is again a question you asked me about the lawyer that M Mr. Al Shamsi, that uh, Mr. Al Sadek yes. was able to engage. He is the lawyer that Mr. Al Sadek's wife tried to engage at the outset. And you'll see everything is pleaded on this at um, paragraphs 115 to 117 of the particulars of claim. 115 to 117. It's supplementary bundle 221, 222. And um, that makes pretty clear and supports our case that he was denied. He finally did get access to the lawyer that his wife had been trying to get him access no, to. Um, the defendants do not admit that. Um, your, that's paragraph 97.2 of the defence. It's not in the bundle, but it's in your soft copy uh, bundle. Um, now, then the last point on legal representation. Um, a point is relied upon in the pleading that at the first meeting on the 9th of September, uh, Mr. Gerard offered uh, Mr. Al Sadek a lawyer, and that was declined by him on the basis that he himself is a lawyer. You'll remember my learned friend took you to that uh, in the pleadings. Now, if you go to the note of that meeting, the, the Deckert note, and you've got an extract in the bundle, uh, supplementary bundle, page 312 to 315. It's only an extract. We can give you the entire note if you would like to see it. But we have checked that full attendance note, and nothing is recorded there about Mr. Uh, uh, Al Sadek declining to have any legal uh, representation because he was happy to represent himself. My lords, if something of that nature was said, you would certainly expect it to be recorded in the note. So if it's of assistance, we will provide uh, the full note. Well, I think it's the boots on the other foot. You're saying you've seen the, the full we note. Uh, you say it doesn't say anything that supports the pleading. Yes. Um, and um, we'll take that from you, obviously, unless um, uh, Mr. Eadie says... Yes. Um, I'm going to just end two very short points on litigation privilege. Hmm. Um, yesterday, my Lord, Lord Justice Popwell questioned whether if, if we are right that Dr. Massad was pursued as part of a vendetta, it would surely follow that litigation was in reasonable contemplation from the outset. Um, now, in our submission, it doesn't follow from our case uh, that, that it is established from the outset, and for this reason. The authorities are very clear that a general apprehension of litigation is not sufficient. It's necessary for the party to reasonably contemplate 
the specific litigation in respect of which the dominant purpose test is satisfied. And that's Philip Morris, paragraph 68 of the Court of Appeals Judgment, Authority Bundle, tab 22, page 449. And that means the defendants need to satisfy you that the specific litigations well, were contemplated. Um, it's clear, if you have <coughs> another point to make, I think yes. you've made the point you need to make. Yes. Well, it's a point, it's a point can I say why it's important? The, the precise dates at which litigation is contemplated are very important in this case. Because if they're wrong by a matter of a week or two, that could generate a very significant uh, number of, of uh, documents. Um, and they, they still need to evidence their claim. The burden is to make their, their claim. And our, our points about insufficiency of evidence still apply. My Lord's final point, on only one point I want to say about the victim point. I obviously made um, submissions yesterday that um, uh, their proposition about extending litigation privilege in this way entails a huge widening. And I gave the example of it would allow all sorts of witnesses and experts to claim privilege. Now, as I understand my learned friend's submission this afternoon, his retort is, well, it doesn't result in a huge widening, because in all these examples, the witness or the expert couldn't satisfy the dominant purpose test, because all of the communications with the third party would have been at the direction of the party to the litigation. So there isn't separate litigation privilege for the witness or expert there. But my lords, if that's right, why doesn't the same rationale then apply to other types of third party communications? In other words, why doesn't that also, why wouldn't they also be regarded as having been at the direction of the party to the litigation, with the consequence that in other cases the third party can also not claim their privilege? So my lords, that isn't an answer to my point. Ah, very nice. It's not gift wrapped, though. But um, what is it? I, it's something we've asked. Burden, it is. It's the burden of proof. Um, textbook extract. Oh, very well. Some Thank of you. All of you may want it. None of you may want it. And I'll take it back. No, uh, no, we asked for it, so it would be churlish of us not to um, accept it. Well, just while those are coming up, um, we're most grateful. Um, for the um, submissions on both sides and a great deal of work has obviously gone into them by those uh, two or three rows back. Also grateful to the transcriber who has um, had some long sessions and some very um, dense material to transcribe, so we're grateful to her. Um, you will be disappointed to hear that we're not going to hand down our judgments uh, straight away. Uh, clearly this requires uh, careful consideration. Uh, Draft judgments will be circulated in the usual way uh, for the purpose of uh, agreement, if possible, and in this particular case it may well not be possible, depending on uh, what our decision is, uh, to agree the terms of uh, consequential orders. Uh, if it is not possible to agree, then we'll need written submissions, and we'll have to decide how those written submissions are best dealt with, we would of course also be grateful in the usual way for uh, indications of any typographical or other minor factual errors. Uh, council and those behind them, well I think we're very well aware of the guidance in the Council General for Wales case about the limited purposes for which um, the uh, draft judgments are circulated, which has implications for the limited further circulation within the teams that they should have. Uh, and um, uh, it's important that everyone is well aware of that. Uh, uh, other than that, unless there's anything else that I should have dealt with, um, it's enough to say thank you, and uh, thank you for the Christmas present.